Hello and welcome to my channel. This video is a part two of the series that I'm making about Kurt Cobain. In the first video that I made about Kurt, I talked about his childhood, his upbringing, and, you know, just his general life and family life and, you know, things like that when he was growing up. But in this video, I am going to talk about Kurt's professional life, his time in Nirvana, and his projects, basically, during his career. So, um, I just think that the intro for my last video was very, very long. So I'm just going to keep it short today, and I am going to get right into the video. In the mid-1980s, Kurt started playing with the local sludge rock band, the Melvins, as I mentioned in the last video. The Melvins would themselves gain fame nationally in the 1990s. Kurt became unmotivated and disappointed after early touring with Nirvana because the bands were unable to draw substantial crowds and because of the fact that they did have a hard time to support themselves financially. In 1985, Kurt created a homemade tape of some songs together with the drummer of the Melvins. This later caught the eye of local bassist Chris Novoselic. Cobain and Novoselic created Nirvana together in 1987, and they thereafter recruited a number of different drummers to record demo tapes with them and to play small shows throughout the Northwest with them. They did eventually settle with the drummer Chad Channing. One of the group's demo tapes found its way to Jonathan Poneman of the Seattle independent record label called Sub Pop. He signed the band to produce its first single called Love Bus in 1988 and its first album called Bleach in 1989. Member of Nirvana and another American alternative rock band called Screaming Trees formed a side project known as The Jury in 1989. The band featured Cobain on vocals and guitar, Mark Lanigan or Lanigan also on vocals, Christ Novo Selic on bass, and Mark Pickerel on drums. The band recorded four songs, also performed by Lead Belly, Where Did You Sleep Last Night, an instrumental version of Grey Goose, Ain't It a Shame, and They Hung Him on a Cross. Kurt was inspired to record the songs after he received a copy of Lead Belly's Last Sessions from friend Slim Moon, and after Kurt heard it, he, quote, felt a connection to Lead Belly's almost physical expressions of longing and desire. Cobain and his girlfriend Toby Vale of Bikini Kill collaborated on a musical project called Bathtub is Real in 1990, in which they both sang, played guitar and played drums. They recorded their songs on a four-track tape machine that belonged to Vale's father. Toby has claimed that, quote, would play the songs he was writing, I would play the songs I was writing, and we'd record them on my dad's four-track. Sometimes I'd sing on the songs he was writing and play drums on them. He was really into the fact that I was creative and into music. I don't think he'd ever played music with a girl before. He was super inspiring and fun to play with. The album Bleach had a unique sound that were going to be the band's signature. It mixed the rawness of punk rock with pop hooks. 
It did not take long before major record labels wanted to sign with Nirvana. Cobain, however, became dissatisfied with Channing's style and subsequently fired him and then instead hired Dave Grohl. Grohl joined in 1990 and the same year, Nirvana released their major label debut called Nevermind. It featured the hit single Smells Like Teen Spirit and it became the first alternative rock album to achieve widespread popularity with a mainstream audience, popularizing a subgenre of alternative rock called grunge. As a result, alternative rock became a dominant genre on the radio and on American music television in the US in the first half of the 1990s. Nirvana was considered the flagship band of Generation X. Nevermind catapulted Nirvana into worldwide fame and Kurt Cobain came to be the named voice of his generation and it was a title that Kurt was never really comfortable with. He resented his let me try to pronounce this characterization I did good right I think I did good anyway since he believed that his artistic message had been misinterpreted by the public I think it might be a little bit dark that's maybe not that light <laughs> it's gonna hurt my eyes Cobain struggled to reconcile the massive success of Nirvana with his underground roots and vision. He also felt persecuted by the media. He compared himself to Francis Farmer or Francis Farmer. For context, Francis was an American actress and television hostess, born in the 19th of September in 1913. She appeared in over a dozen of feature films over the course of her career, though she garnered notoriety for sensationalized accounts of her life, especially her involuntary commitment to psychiatric hospitals and her subsequent mental health struggles. She died of cancer on the 1st of August in 1970 at the age of 56. Kurt even named a song after her. Kurt began to resent people who called themselves fans of the band, but who refused to acknowledge or misinterpreted the band's social and political views. He was a vocal opponent, opponent of sexism, racism, sexual assault and homophobia, and he was publicly proud that Nirvana had played at a gay rights benefit concert that was held to oppose Oregon's 1992 ballot measure 9, which would have directed Oregon schools to teach that homosexuality was, quote, abnormal, wrong, unnatural and perverse. Cobain was also a vocal supporter of the pro-choice movement and Nirvana was involved in L7's Rock for Choice campaign. Cobain did receive death threats from a small number of anti-abortion activists for participating in the pro-choice campaign and one activist even threatened to shoot Cobain the second that he entered the stage. Yeah, because it's so pro-life to shoot somebody, right? In 1992, Cobain contacted William S. Burroughs about a possible collaboration. Burroughs responded by sending him a recording of the Junkies Christmas, which he had recorded in his studio in Lawrence, Kansas. Months later, at a studio in Seattle, Cobain added guitar backing 
based on Silent Night and to Anacreon in Heaven, Anacreon, to Anacreon in Heaven. Not long after that, the pair would meet in Lawrence, Kansas, and they would produce the priest, they called him, a spoken word version of the Junkies Christmas. Yeah, Burroughs is Burroughs. the king, yeah. Yeah, I actually got to do a record with him, a 10-inch record. With, you are doing William. it? I, we, it's already out, yeah. He did a, he did a um, passage from a, from a poem called The Priest They Called Him and I played guitar in the background, just made a bunch of noise. Since their debut, Nirvana has sold over 28 million albums in the United States alone and over 75 million worldwide. The success of the album Nevermind provided numerous Seattle bands such as Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden access to wider audiences. According to Grohl, Cobain believed that music comes first and lyrics second, and that he focused primarily on the melodies. He complained when fans and rock journalists attempted to decipher his singing and extract meaning from his lyrics. Though he insisted on the subjectivity and unimportance of his lyrics, Kurt laboured and procrastinated in writing them, often changing the content and order of lyrics during his performances. Cobain would describe his own lyrics as a big pile of contradictions. Quote, they are split down the middle between very sincere opinions that I have, and sarcastic opinions and feelings that I have, and sarcastic and hopeful, humorous rep reputals toward cliché bohemians' ideals that have been exhausted for years. Originally, Cobain wanted Nevermind to be divided into two sides, a boy side for the songs written about the experiences of his early life and his childhood, and a girl side for the songs written about his dysfunctional relationship with his girlfriend Toby Vale. Cobain wrote Lithium before meeting Vale, but he wrote the lyrics to reference her. Kurt wrote lyrics about dealing with his parents' divorce, his newfound fame, and the public image and perception of himself and Courtney Love in Serve the Servants. He wrote about his relationship with love through lyrical themes of pregnancy and the female anatomy in Heart Shapes books. Cobain wrote R Word Me as an objective discussion of the R-word. He also wrote about drug addiction and abortion in Pen Royal Tea, as well as about women's rights and the life of Frances Farmer in Frances Farmer Will Have Her Revenge on Seattle. After reading a newspaper story about an incident in 1987, when a 14-year-old girl was kidnapped after attending a punk rock show and then R-worded and tortured with a blowtorch, Kurt felt affected enough to write the song Polly, featured on Nevermind. The girl escaped after gaining the trust of her captor, Gerald Friend, through flirting with him. Bob Dylan cited Polly as the best one of Nirvana's songs after he saw Nirvana perform. Dylan said, quote, The kid has heart about Cobain. Patrick Suskins, or Patrick Suskins, I think that it's actually pronounced, um, or like correctly pronounced Suskins, or Suskins, Suskins, 
because I always heard when I was a child with that it's that U with two dots over it, um, and I always got to hear when I was a child when I said muesli instead of muesli um, because it's a German U. So we do actually share quite a few words with Germany. I don't know if they stole them from us or we stole them from them. I think it's the latter because we are actually very prone to stealing words <laughs> here in Sweden. We want to be like everyone else in Sweden um, as a country. We just want to fit in, you know, and that's kind of kind of why we like steal words. Um, but anyway, anyway, this Patrick's novel called The Story of a Murderer inspired Cobain to write the song Scentless Apprentice. The book is a historical horror novel about a perfumer's apprentice born with no body odor of his own but with a highly developed sense of smell and who attempts to create the ultimate perfume by killing virginal women and taking their scent. I actually felt quite compelled to find that book somewhere so I can read it. <laughs> I don't know why, I'm just... my mind is wicked. I love true crime and I love horror movies about, you know, violent stuff. But you know, realistic stuff. That's the kind of horror that I like to watch. I don't know why, probably because it's more close to home, because it could actually happen. I'm not actually a big reader. Most people think that I am, and I love writing, so I should love reading, but my mind is very busy all the time, thinking and uh, going over stuff and over and over analyzing, and um, I have found that when I read, I tend to, you know, get lost in my thoughts. And I have to reread the same sentences over and over and over again, um, which is so boring. My mind is just not the best at focusing at text because my, my thoughts just interfere all the time. I am better at listening, so you know, sound books or um, whatever they're called in English is of course an option that I'm considering because that would be easier. But anyway, um, I, I might might read this or listen to this because it, it sounds very weird and very fascinating actually. <laughs> Cobain immersed himself in artistic projects throughout his life just as much as he did in songwriting. His artworks followed the same subjects of his lyrics which he often expressed through a dark sense of humour. Kurt found himself fascinated by psychology, his own rare medical conditions, and the human anatomy. According to Novo Selic, Kurt said, quote, that he never liked the literal things. He liked cryptic things. He would cut out pictures of meat from the grocery store flyers, then paste these orchids on them, Novo Selic also expressed that in Cobain's art there are these people and they're all weird, like mutants and dolls, creepy dolls. As Kurt was often unable to afford artistic resources, he improvised with materials, painting on board games and album sleeves and he painted with a lot of different substances, including his own bodily fluids. Disgusting! Many of Cobain's paintings, larches and sculptures appeared in the artwork of Nirvana's albums, such as the covers of Incesticide and In Utero or Utero. His concepts were also featured in Nirvana's music videos, sometimes resulting in arguments with the video producers. Cobain played backing guitar for a spoken word recording of beat poet William S. Burroughs called The Priest They Called Him. Cobain thought of 
Burroughs as a hero. During Nirvana's European tour, he kept a copy of Burroughs' Naked Lunch purchased from a London bookstore. Cobain met with Burroughs at his home in Lawrence, Kansas in October of 1993. Burroughs expressed no surprise at Kurt's death. Quote, it wasn't an act of will for Kurt to off himself. As far as I was concerned, he was dead already. So, that was everything that I had for this video. I think it will be a shorter one, and it was certainly very quick to record, which is nice. <laughs> but yeah, and I hope that the lighting was good, because I don't know, I think I had a, a very much um, colder lighting the last time, and that was very, very uh, hard on my eyes. My eyes was painful and sore after recording the last time, so I think this this one is better, and I found a really nice way to sit in this video. So I was a bit further away from the camera, but that is positive, I think, um, because then I can include more footage of cut, you know, pictures and videos and things like that. And if you've watched this far, I am so grateful for you. I am grateful for you anyway. Um, for just clicking on the video and watching and I hope that you got something from it. Today is a very good day for me, I feel like. I woke up earlier than usual and it's been a bright day outside. The snow has gone back to Sweden. I actually like the snow. I'm a great procrastinator, unfortunately, so I procrastinate for as long as possible. When it comes to making uh, videos because it is a process, you know, but I was actually very quick this time to um, to write down the facts and to uh, make this video for you. And I surely hope that you liked it. We are 500 plus subscribers on this channel. We are actually closer to 550, if I remember it correctly. And um, I would be very, very, very grateful if you would consider to help me to reach uh, 600. Because, you know, everything matters. You know, all of you matters. And I absolutely love when you comment. And I, I get so happy when you like and support this channel. Because it's truly something that brings me joy. And actually, one of the things that I've decided for this year is to be a lot more active on this channel than I was last year. Because before I was like tending to make videos and then I was like, okay, now I don't have to make any more for a while. And that while would turn into a very, very long while. So, you know, life gets between and, you know, everything like that. But now I just feel very committed to this channel and I feel... I feel very blessed by everyone who wants to watch and wants to support the channel. And also, I just want to say that I do have a Facebook page. So if you do have any any suggestions uh, for videos, and if you just want to chat with me, that's cool too. You can inbox me on Facebook. I don't know if that's, if that's what it's called. That's probably what it's called on, you know mail and stuff but anyways it sounds cool so whatever but if you just want to chat or if you have any suggestions for videos or totally new video series even when i've made all three videos of Kurt, i'm going to make another amazing women that changed the music industry i have a hard time speaking today if you haven't noticed but anyway, I had one lady in mind, one girl, one, one woman in mind that I've had in mind for as long as I've had the idea of that series. And um, of course, I am going to make a video about her. But I actually got recommended this super cool lady. I'm not saying that the other girl is not, the other woman is not cool because she definitely is. She is 
amazing, just like every other woman I'm going to talk about, but she's just so groundbreaking. I've never seen anything like that. I never knew that, like, they, they said in the comments that she's a pioneer of, like, rock music, and honestly, she's just the, the coolest lady I've come across in a very, very long time. And I am so excited to find out more about her and who she was and um, her music. Such a cool lady, just doing her own thing, just paving the way for other ladies in the industry. So that's something that I'm going to do. But I'm also thinking about incorporating some true crime uh, on this channel. It's all going to be in the category of like vintage and retro, you know, I'm I'm a very vintage and retro inspired girl. <laughs> it's not going to be anything wildly different from anything that I'm currently doing on the channel, but you know, maybe true crime about celebrities, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, about that series about the women, amazing women that changed the music industry, that series is something that I really love to do and I think it's really important to acknowledge the weight and the impact that these women had on the industry and it's very close to my heart as a feminist. I know that you're not allowed to say that you are a feminist these days but I don't care. I think that both men and women are amazing but I don't think that there is any doubt about that women are oppressed in today's society. And I truly, truly uh, admire Kurt for standing up for these things. He did really take it seriously. He, he knew that he was impacting people a lot and that he had a, a, a great power over fans and over the generation that he was in. And he did definitely do good and he did definitely bring awareness and he did fight for a good cause a lot of the times. And I don't think that, that there were anything mean or evil in him. I think that he was a good man. He probably had a really good heart. His life was a roller coaster nonetheless, but I definitely think that it's worth noting that he definitely did want to do good and he definitely he definitely had his heart questions. That's what we say in Sweden when when we have an opinion or something that is important to us, we call that heart question. I don't think that that's the correct term in uh, in English, but anyway, that series um, about women that change the music industry doesn't go very well. It doesn't get as much exposure or as much interaction and spread as some of the Dead Rock Stuff Acts videos do because they are mainly about men and I think that's really 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 sad and it makes me unmotivated and um, discouraged to continue on with it even though that it is very important to me and that it is something that I do want to do. It's still very still very discouraging and unmotivating when People don't want to watch. So if you want to, I would definitely, definitely be very grateful if you headed over to the playlist and uh, watched those videos and um, gave them some love and gave them some boost. Yeah, as I said, I would greatly appreciate it. And well, that was everything that I wanted to talk about in this video. And as I said before, I truly hope that you liked it and i hope to see you in the next video if you want to don't forget to support this channel if you like it and yeah um, if you want to we'll see each other again bye